Okay, welcome back to the course on computer organization and architecture. This is the first module of this particular course. Before going to the course matters, I slightly want to explain about the method of pedagogy and the outcome based learning. Because in this course, we will follow the approach of outcome based learning. Now, first question arises what is pedagogy? The dictionary meaning it says that the method and practice of teaching, especially as an academic subject or theoretical concept. So, this is the defined definition of, of pedagogy. So, this is a method of practice for teaching something in universities for theoretical subject and we will follow the outcome based learning and outcome based learning basically learner centric. So, the participation for the learner is most essential when we follow this particular outcome based learning. Now, we talk about the teaching methodologies. Now, we are teaching teachers are teaching to the student from long back, but people felt that there should be a proper mechanism or methodologies to teach the student for a subject. So, for that reason a group of college and university professor led by Benjamin S. Bloom published a handbook in 1956 called Taxonomy of Educational Objective, the classification of educational goal. So, Bloom technology is used extensively for planning of teaching and learning objective. So, basically Bloom technology says about the planning of teaching and learning activities. So, it is having two components one is teaching and another is learning. So, we have to plan or the instructor has to plan how to teach a subject and secondly learner or the students have a plan how to learn the subject. So, in Bloom's taxonomy we define all those things and accordingly we try to deliver our lecture. So, when we are going for the learning or when we are going to teach a subject basically all categories of learning can be categorized into three different domain as per Bloom's taxonomy. These domains are cognitive domain, psychomotor domain and affective domain. So, in case of cognitive domain it involves thinking. So, basically we are going to teach the student the subject matter. So, that we can generate the thinking process on the student they should think why it is happening and how it is going to solve. In most of the higher learning activities we use that cognitive domain. Another domain is your psychomotor domain which involve action. Basically, these courses are mostly dominated by practicals. You have to know how to handle an equipment, how to take readings and how efficiently you can handle the equipment. So, those issues are define or address in psychomotor domain and another domain is your affective domain which involve feelings and attitude. So, we have to give some training to the students also how to handle the situation, how to work with a team, how to control his own sentiment all those things should be a part of this particular learning activities. In this course or in the higher education mainly we concentrate on cognitive domain and cognitive domain is based on thinking skill. The domain most involved in higher education and it includes all the learning that deals with recall, recognition and development of intellectual abilities and skill. So, basically that learning method basically talk about some recall of your earlier knowledge, then recognize some situation and finally, develop the intellectual abilities and skill to solve the real life situation. So, in cognitive domains we address those issues and in this course basically we are going to address mainly in the cognitive domain. Again there are some sub classification or labels in every domain. So, in cognitive domain basically the sub classifications are in the lowest level it is knowledge. So, we will give some ideas in knowledge level which is required and after looking into the scenario you will be able to comprehend the situation and you can apply your knowledge this will go into the application level when you get a new scenario or new situation you will be able to analyze it depending on your knowledge 
and finally, what will happen? It will be the design process. Basically, you are you will able to design a new system, which is the synthesizing the system, and finally, you can evaluate the system. So, this is the from lowest level to highest level. When a student or learner achieves the highest level, it is assumed that he has already mastered the lower level classes. So, in this way, while delivering our lectures, we will indicate which portion has address in which level, whether it is in application level or it is in design level. Now, in outcome based learning, always we have to think about what is the outcome of the course, what the learners is going to accept after going through this particular course. So, in that particular case, initially we are going to define the objective of the course and once we go through the course and once we complete the course, we will make sure that all the objective will be achieved or all the objective will be met by the student. So, first objective, we are just looking into this way, it is in the design phase or it is in the synthesis level. What we say that given a set of programming constructs, categorize them according to their effect and design instruction for each category which can be implemented in hardware. So, it is a design objective or final objective is to design the computer system. So, why you are going to design a computer system? We are having some requirement. First of all, we have to identify those requirement and accordingly we have to come with a algorithm or you can say this is the programming construct. Now, whatever task we want to perform have to be categorized into different category and for each and every category we are going to define the operation or tax. Finally, those operation will be implemented in hardware. So, we are going to meet this objective while go through this particular course. Objective 2, again it is in the design level. So, what we are going to say, given a set of specific instruction, design an efficient CPU with hardware control and microprogram control methodologies. So, basic objective or objective 2 is a design of an efficient, efficient CPU, central processing unit. And while we are going to design a processor, we are going to look for two methodologies. One methodology is called hardware controlled and second methodology is called micro program controlled methodologies. So, we are going to address the design issues with the help of these two methodologies. So, once we have met this objective, then learner will design a processor either by hardware control logic or micro program control methodologies. Objective 3, we are talking about again synthesis level or design issues. Given a CPU organization and instructions, design a memory module and analyze it operation by interfacing with the CPU. So, memory is also a important component in the processor. We are going to meet the objective how to design a memory unit and how to interface that particular memory unit with the processor. Objective 4, again it is in the synthesis level and design issues. Given a CPU organization and specification of peripheral devices, design an IO module and analyze it operation by interfacing with CPU. So, computer will come up with some peripheral devices, input output devices, how to integrate those particular input output devices, what are the design issues, we are going to discuss and we are going to meet this objective also while complete this particular course. Objective 5 this is evaluation or performance evaluation you can say, this is your assessment of our design. It says that given a CPU organization assess its performance and apply design technique to enhance performance using pipelining, parallelism and risk methodologies. So, while designing our processor there will be some issues or there is scope to improve the performance. So, we are going to just evaluate it and we will address those issues only, we are not going into the design process. Okay. The design process will be addressed in some higher level course. Objective 6, we are talking about it is in the level of application or you can solve something. What we are saying for a given instruction set and instruction format of a processor, one will be able to write an assembly level program for a given problem to solve it using that processor. So, if you look for any processor that is available and if you know the instruction set and instruction format, then efficiently you will be able to write a program in assembly level to solve any problem. 
So, this is in the application level. So, we are defining six objective, we are defining six objective for this particular course and throughout this particular course we are going to deliver a lecture in such a way that finally, we are going to meet all those particular objective. Now, already we have mentioned that the course will be divided into several modules and the first module is fundamentals of digital computers. Now, what we are going to address in this particular module, we are going to see basically we are going to now define the objective of this particular module. So, what are the objective? We are defining the objective like that. Objective 1, describe the model of computer and working principle of computer. So, this is basically in the analysis level. So, how a computer works and what is the model we are going to achieve once we meet this particular objective. Objective 2, preliminaries of digital building blocks. So, this is in the knowledge level. So, we need several digital blocks, we will simply give the introduction of those particular building blocks only. So, it is in knowledge level. Once we have the knowledge of those particular component, then we can use those things while designing our computer. Objective 3, describe the representation of information and number system. This is also in knowledge level. Just we will mention how a information is represented in computer and how number system is used to represent our information. Just see here we are defining these two things in your knowledge level, but if we are going to address the for example, I am saying if we are going to address this uh, digital building blocks in details, then we are going to address these things in another subject. In that particular subject, we are going to address those particular issues in higher level, may be in the design level. So, that is why we are saying that the prerequisite for this particular course is the digital system. So, once you have gone through this particular course, then you will be knowing the details of this particular digital system. Here, we are simply given knowledge level view and we are going to use those things. Objective 4, explain the components of processor, it is in the comprehension level. So, here what we are going to see, what are the components are there and how they are interconnected and once you see these things, then you will able to comprehend how computer works. So, this is in this module, we are having these things in the comprehension level, but in subsequent module, those issues go, will go into the design level, because ultimately you have to know everything in details. Objective 5, describe the interfacing mechanism of storage unit and I O devices. So, this is also in comprehension level, memory is an integral part of our computer. So, here we are simply going to give the introduction and how we are going to connect it and how we are going to use it. But in another module, we are going to address all those issues in, in details and it will be in the design level. Objective 6, explain the execution of program in a processor and categorize of computer programming language, it is an application level. So, we are going to give example or will show or will illustrate it with example how a processor exactly execute a program. Here we are going to give the module learning strategy, what is the strategy of learning this particular module. So, here basically we are going to give all the resources that will be used for this particular courses. So, for unit 1 we are going to use the book computer organization and architecture designing for performance, just I am looking for the seventh edition of that particular book and it is written by William Stallings. So, for this unit 1, you have to go through chapter 1, it is a very small chapter and the section 2.1 of chapter 2. So, if you go through simply read this particular materials, then you will be able to understand what we are going to discuss about these things. And in my presentation, I am going to use the materials from this particular book and some of the slides I have borrowed from the author's home page also and some of the slide I have modified according to my convenience. For unit 2, the reference book is a digital design third edition and author is M. Morris Mano. So, here I am mentioning four chapters that is three chapters that is chapter 4, 5 and 6. So, in those particular chapters detailed design issues are mentioned, but here we are going to address these things in knowledge level. So, if you want to brush up then you can go through those particular chapter or if you are confident or conversion about those issues then you can skip this particular chapters. 
For unit 3, again I am going to use the book by Stallings, Computer Organization Architecture Designing for Performance and these are basically taken from the chapter 9 of that particular book. So, for unit 4, 5 and 6, again I am using the same books, the book written by William Stallings. So, for module unit 4, you have to look for the chapter 12, this is the section 12.1, 12.2 and 12.3. For unit 5, I am taking some material from chapter 3, mainly section from 3.1 to 3.4. And for unit 6, again I am using the same book again in the chapter 3 and this material is taken from chapter 3.2. So, if you go through those particular section, then it will be easier to follow my lectures. Now, we have defined the objective of our course. The course is divided into several modules and the first module is your fundamental of digital computer. Again this module is divided into several unit. So, what are the units? We are dividing it to it 6 unit. First unit is model of computer and working principle. Unit 2 is digital logic building blocks. Unit 3 information representation and number system. Unit 4 basic elements of the processor. Unit 5 storage and I O interfaces and unit 6 execution and program and programming languages. Already I have mentioned about the modern learning strategies. So, you know what are the resources that we are going to use for those particular units. Now, unit 1 this is model of computers and working principle. So, what are the objective of this particular module? Objective 1 explain the working principle of computer again it is in a knowledge level. Describe the components of a computer, it is in the comprehension level and objective 3 illustrate the evaluation of computer, it is in knowledge level. Currently, you are most of you are working with a computer, you have at least used the computer to browse the net, send mails to your friend, you are using some software to draft your letters and some of you might have used some compilers also to write program in high level languages compile it and then execute it. So, here is in the computer, but it is better to know how we have achieved this particular level today. So, for that we are just simply going to brief idea about the evolution of computers also in this particular course. Now, the name of the subject is computer organization and architecture. So, in this course name itself we are having two terms one is your architecture and second one is organization. So, we are going to see what are the things that we are going to address in architecture and what are the things that we are going to address in organization. So, in architecture we are going to say that architecture is those attributes visible to the programmer. So, when you are going to use a computer you are going to solve your problem and you know that to solve this problem you have to have some operation or instruction. So, these instructions are visible to a user. So, these are the issues which are visible to the users are basically addressed in the architecture. So, basically what we are going to address in architecture? What is the instruction set? That means, what are the instruction that we have in that particular computer? What is the format of instruction? Each and every instruction should have a format and we have to adhere to this particular format and we are going to design all those things in the architecture level. And we have to uh, handle our I O devices, which way or what are the instruction that we have to handle those particular I O devices will also be addressed in the architecture level. So, once we freeze the architectures, then what will happen? Now, we will go for the implementation it, which is the organizational view. For example, here I am saying that is there a multiply instruction. So, when we are going to design an instruction set, we will see that whether multiplication is required or not and whether we are going to put a multiplication instruction or not. If we feel that we have to put a multiplication instruction, then in the architecture level itself we are going to freeze it, we will say this is an instruction of our instruction set and the format of the instruction also we are going to specify it. Now, when we go to the organization, it says that how we are going to implement those particular features that already we have defined in our architecture. So, we need to generate several control signals, 
So, how to generate those particular control signal, how we are going to place the component, all those things will be discussed in the organizational issues. Here, one example I am giving say, is there a hardware multiply unit or is it done by repeated addition? Now, you just see that when we said that in my processor we are going to put an multiplier or we are going to put an multiplication instruction. Now, how we are going to implement it? We are having several algorithms and most of you might be knowing that we are having an algorithm called Booth algorithm by which we can multiply two numbers. That Booth algorithms can be implemented in hardware and we can put that particular multiplier unit. This is one way of implementing our multiplication. But another way also we can look into it that we are having an addition instruction, we can use that addition instruction to get the effect of multiplication which is known as your repeated addition. So, as for example, if I want to multiply 5 by 7, 5 into 7, then what we can do? I can add 5 7 times. So, this is called done by repeated addition. Now, this is a organizational issue, we have to freeze it what way we are going to do it. So, if I am going to implement it hardware, one issue is like that, we are going to get a faster response, but it involves cost. If we are going to use the repeated addition, then system will be slower, but we may save cost. So, these are the issues we are going to address or freeze in our organizational issues. Now, again when going to look into the organization and architecture, mainly in architecture, we are going to get a families of architecture like that one family is known as your Intel x86. So, in that particular case Intel 86, what we will have? We are having a common architecture. So, first we have the processor called 8086. So, we are having some instruction set and we know the instruction format. Then what Intel has done? They have enhanced the instruction and going to 80186. Like that they have gone for 80286. Like that they are enhancing the instruction set. So, this is called a family concept. Similarly, IBM is also having a family system called 370 family. So, what is the advantage of these things? It gives a code compatibility and it says at least backward. Now, what does it mean? Say, if you are having a software or we have written a program in your 80186, it is executed or it can execute this particular program in your 80186. Now, Intel has announced this processor to 80286. What does it mean? That means, they have written the earlier instruction and along with that they gave us some more instruction to solve our problem. So, whatever instruction is there in your 186, all are available in 286, but along with that we are having some more additional instruction. So, whatever software we have developed in 186, they can run in 286 also because all those instructions are available. So, we said this is at least backward compatibility, but if you are writing a new program in 286, it may not run in 186 because some of the instruction may not be available in 186. So, in the family structure or family organization, one is your code compatibility. There is another issue we are having that organization differs between different version. So, basically if you look into the Intel product, you know that there is a processor called Pentium. Again Pentium has two version, one called Pentium Pro and second one is your Celeron. So, if you go for a particular Pentium processor, you will find that the architecture of the Pentium and the architecture of Celeron are same, but they differ in organization. So, the way we are putting a component, it is different in Pentium Pro or it is different in Celeron. So, that is why it says that organization differs between different versions. So, company releases different version, they differ in organization, but architecture is same. So, all software will run in both the processor, but since organization is different, so there may be some issues on performance. One may have better performance than the other. Now, we will see what is a model of computer. If you see the computer model, the main component is your CPU, central processor unit. So, this is the central processor unit, which is the main processing part. It is having two part, one is called arithmetic and logic unit and second one is your program control unit. So, all the processing is done in the central processing unit. Along with that, we are having main memory. 
So, informations are available in the main memory and processor take this particular information from main memory and process the job and store the result in main memory. And to keep the information in the main memory, we need input output devices. So, we have to have some input output devices to give the information. So, we can use those devices to work with the computer. As a simple example now I can say that this stylus pen is an input device, I can write something over here and once I am writing it then it is going to the processor and we are storing it. Secondly, you know about the keyboard, if you press something from in the keyboard, it is acting as an input device and whatever we have pressed in the keyboard, it is displayed in the monitor. So, monitor is an output device. So, through input output devices, we are going to interact with the computer. That means, this is the interface to the external world of the computer. So, this is the basic model of computer and how computer works? It basically works on stored program principle and this principle was introduced by scientist von Neumann and we said that this is a von Neumann stored program concept. So, what is that particular concept? It is having a storage in it, we call it is a main memory. In that particular main memory, we are going to store our program as well as data. ALU operates on binary data. So, we are having a processing element, we call it is an ALU, arithmetic and logic unit. It can perform some arithmetic operation and some logic operation. So, arithmetic operation I can say that addition, subtraction, multiplication like that and logic operation we know that AND or XOR. So, ALU is having all those particular operation and it can perform operation on binary data. Control unit interpreting instruction from memory and executing. So, you just see that we are having in main memory already I have said that here we are storing our data as well as program everything is in binary. Now, that control unit is give the information in such a that we are going to keep bring this particular information inside the processor and processor is going to process the job or perform the tasks and finally, result will be stored in the main memory. So, this is the stored program concept and input and output equipment operate by control in it. Already I said that if I have to give some information then from this particular input devices I am going to give it. So, that processor should have the capabilities to control those particular input devices. As well as when we are keeping this information in main memory or say our result then we have to give this result to the users may be through monitors or may be through printer. So, again control unit is going to perform those particular tasks or control those particular devices to transfer the information from main memory to the output devices. So, basically when we talk about the von Neumann stored program principle, we may concentrate on those particular issue and we can say that this is a closed system CPU or the processor and the main memory. Once we have the information in our main memory, then processor can work with this particular information and perform the job. Now, how to get the information to the main memory? For that, we need this particular input output devices. Through input devices, we can put the information into main memory and once job is done, then we can take out this information through output devices. So, it was basically design and develop in Princeton universities and they say it is Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies and the machine is known as IAS Institute for Advanced Studies and IAS model and this project was completed in 1952. So, this is the basic structure of von Neumann machine which is developed in Princeton universities in Institute of Advanced Studies. So, this is the central processing unit we are having that arithmetic and logic unit and the control unit it is worked with this particular main memory, we should have all the information in main memory and processor is going to handle the information that is available in main memory and carry out its job and the interfacing is done with this particular I O devices, I O equipment. Through input devices, we are going to give the information to the computer that means, we are putting it into the main memory, processor is, is going to take the information from main memory, carry out its job and put the information in the or result in the main memory and through output devices we are going to give the result to the users. 
So, this is the structure of von Neumann stored program principle of von Neumann's machine. Now, whatever computer you are using now, whatever advanced it may be, you can talk about parallel processor or you can talk about the core multi core system where you can have 4 core, 8 core, but all those machine works on this particular von Neumann stored program principle. Now, when we are going to discuss about the computer, basically we are having two issues, one is known as what is the structure of the computer and what are the function that we are having for that particular computer. So, we have to see what is the structure and function. So, structure is the way in which components related to each other and function is the operation of individual components as part of the structure. So, we are going to see how the component function in a computer. First, we are going to look into the functions. What are the functions that we have in a computer? So, if you look into the computer functions, all the function can be categorized into four different category and these categories are one is your data processing, second one is your data storage, third one is your data movement, fourth one is control. So, we may have several instruction or several operation in a computer but all those can be categorized into this particular four category. So, we are going to do some processing job. So, we are having some instruction to process the information, maybe addition of two numbers is a processing instruction or a processing tax. Maybe multiplying two numbers is a processing tax, compare two numbers is a processing tax. So, we should have some instruction to do the data processing. Second one is your data storage. Now, once we are process our information and we are going to get our result, then what will happen? We have to store those particular information. So, we need some instruction for data storage. So, one category of in function is there to store the data. Another categories are your data movement, moving data from one point to the other point like that. I am saying that computer works on von Neumann stored program principle that means, we have to store our information in our main memory. Now, how to move the information to the main memory from our input devices? So, for that we need some instruction. One, we process the data, we store our result in our main memory as per von Neumann stored program principle. Now, how to transfer those information to output devices, maybe like printer? So, for that we need some instruction. So, those instruction comes under this particular data movement and some instruction are there to control the entire machine and the computer. How to control the printer? Say so, when we send give the print comma to send a file to the printer, we have to make sure that printer is ready. One printer is ready, we have to transfer all the information to the printer. So, these are the controlling information that we have to provide that control the printer even to start the printing at the end of the file stop the printing. So, these are the control instruction. So, whatever instruction we are having in the instruction set, all those instruction can be categorized into this particular four functions. So, now we are going to see the functional view. So, one is your data movement, data storage, data processing and control. So, for that when we are going to look for a con functional view, we will see that what are the things that we are having. So, one we are having data movement apparatus, how to move the data. Another component we are having data storage facility, how to store the data. Another one we are having data processing facility to process our information and all those things will be controlled by our control mechanism. So, these are the function that we are having and this is the way we can look into it. Now, what are the function that we are going to do? First one is your data movement. So, that means, data will move from one point to the other point on one device to the other device. Like a simple example I can say, when I press some keys in the keyboard, I am entering something to the computer and that thing is displayed in the monitor. So, this is a data movement, moving information from keyboard to monitor. So, one class of information is your data movement. Second one is your storage. So, we are having information 
in some devices. Now, we have to bring it to the storage unit. So, this is the data movement. So, basically bringing it from the input devices to the storage and from storage to the output devices because computer works on von Neumann stored program principle. So, we have to keep all the information in the storage first then only processor can handle those particular information. So, we need one class of information or instruction which is your basically data storage. Third class is your data processing. So, we we are having the information in our storage. Now, processing elements or processing unit are having different processing element like that adding two numbers, multiplying two numbers. So, depending on our instruction, it will take the information from storage, it will do the processing tax, it will add the two numbers, if my tax is your adding two numbers, and again it will store the result in the storage. So, this is your processing from and to storage and another class is your transferring the information from storage to output devices or through processing. So, we are going to take the information from storage, we process it and we can give it to the output. So, that means, if we want to add two numbers and we want to display the result, then taking the information from storage and processing it and giving the result to the output devices may be to the monitor or secondly we are taking the input from some input devices we process it then we put it into the storage we store it in some memory location. So, this is processing from storage and I O. So, these are the different tasks that we can perform. Now, we will see what is the structure of a computer this is the structural view. So, in that particular case you see how we are going to visualize a computer. You just see that just we are representing a bubble to represent the computer. So, this is a computer now what we can see that it is connected to some peripherals. Peripherals are nothing but the input and output devices. To work with the computer we need some I O devices input output devices these are input output devices will be connected to the computer. And nowadays network or computer network is an integral part. So, we should have provision to connect to the network. So, we are having that communication link also. So, if you see computer we will just simply see that this is the representing with the help of bubble this is the computer along with that we are having some peripheral devices and we are having interconnection network. Now, what is there inside the bubble? So, we are going to look for top down approach you just see that now we can bubble up this particular computer and we are going to see what are the components that we have inside this particular computer. So, here we are going to say that we have the central processor unit CPU generally in most of the books in the primary level or school level will say you will get a sentence like that CPU is the brain of computer. So, it is going to perform the tasks. Now, how computer works? It works on von Neumann stored program principle. So, we have to keep the information in some storage unit. So, this is the second component called memory unit or main memory. So, processor is going to work with the information data available in the main memory. Now, how we are going to get information in the main memory? Through input devices. So, we are having this particular input or output mechanism. So, if you see that these are the three basic functional unit that we have in computer. So, we can visualize or you can view the structure of the computer like that. Now, there should have a communication between all those components because we have to take something from input to the memory, from memory to the processor, again from processor to the memory, maybe memory to the output. So, all are connected together. So, we are having a system interconnection network we are having different way to implement these things we will see we will discuss these issues. So, when we are going to visualize the computer as a bubble what are the things that we have inside the computer we are going to get four basic component central processing unit main memory and input output and they are connected to the system interconnection. Now, when we have seen that inside computer now we know that we are having CPU main memory 
I.O. and system bus. Now, what is inside this particular CPU? Now, again we can bubble it up. Now, we are going to see what are the things that we have. So, for that already we have mentioned that we are having a processing element and generally which is known as your ALU or arithmetic and logic unit. We are having some arithmetic operation and we are having some logic operation. Depending on the instruction set, we have to have this particular ALU. Some of the functionalities has to be implemented in hardware basic or some of the instruction may be done in the software, we will discuss these things in later. Secondly, when we are bringing the information from storage main memory, we need some temporary storage space inside the processor and these are known as my registers. In registers, we can store some information. So, we are having some registers in the processor and we say this is the register bank which is nothing but the temporary storage. And along with that, now we need the control unit which is the main part of the CPU and we are going to give more emphasis on design of this control unit. So, the basic task of the control unit is to synchronize the operation transfer the information from main memory to the processor, then process the job, then whatever result you are getting transfer it to the main memory. So, everything needs to be done in a coherent way and have to be done in a proper sequence. That sequencing signals will be generated through this particular control unit. Now, we are going to discuss or in this particular course, we are going to discuss about the all the design issues of this particular control unit. Again, Inside this processor, inside this CPU, all those particular components has to be connected together. So, for that we are again having an internal CPU interconnection. Now, you just see that, now when we are going to visualize it, view it, what is there inside the CPU central processor unit? Again, we are going to get this particular four components. Okay. Like that, in top down approach, we are going to explore each and every bubble. And finally, in subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss everything in details. We will look for all the design issues of all those particular components. Now, when we talk about the CPU, you just see that we know that it is having ALU, registers, and control unit, and they are connected through this particular internal bus. Now, what is there in control unit? Again, we can see or we can bubble it up, and basically, already I have mentioned that we have to maintain the proper sequence for that we are having this particular sequential logic. So, we have to design and implement this particular sequencing logic, so that everything will be done in proper sequence. For this doing the proper controlling, sometimes we have to keep some information inside the particular control unit also. For that we need a storage or memory and this is known as my control memory. So, some of the information sometimes we are going to store in control memory. And to interpret the information in the control unit, again we may need some registers, decoders etcetera. So, this is basically control unit is going to have some registers and decoders etcetera to have the proper functioning. So, these are the components that we will be having, they will be interconnected, they will be interlinked and we are going to discuss all those issues in our subsequent module. Now, say you are working with a computer, how computer works? Most of you will tell that we are having a computer program and we are going to execute this particular computer program. Once we execute a computer program, then what we are going to get? According to our requirement, we are going to get our result. Now, what is a program? So, if you look into the program, we will say that it is nothing but a sequence of steps or instruction. So, we are having a sequence of steps or we say these are the instruction. Now, what are those instruction? When we talk about this instruction, basically this will come from the instruction set of those particular processor. We have to execute those particular instruction one by one. For each step, an arithmetic of logic operation is done because if I am having an addition operation we are going to perform the addition. So, this is the instruction that we are going to do and for each operation different set of control signals is needed. What we are saying different set of control signals are needed. So, when I am going to perform an instruction say adding two numbers, we need different set of control signals to coordinate all the component. 
and they will be done in different step. So, when I am going to add two numbers, it is not like that in one go I can do it, but it involves several steps. Once you complete all those particular steps, then only that instruction is over. Okay. So, this is a program and in program basically it is nothing but a set of instruction and we are going to execute those instruction in sequence one by one the way we are putting it. So, we can visualize the computer program in that particular way. Now, how we are going to execute a program and when we are going to execute a program we can say this is the instruction cycle already I have mentioned that one instruction cannot be done in one step. We are having several step and complete collection of all those particular steps are known as my instruction cycle. In basic way what will happen I can say that the instruction cycle consists of two steps. One we talk about the fetch and second one is execute. Now, say computer works on von Neumann stored program principle. We are storing our information in main memory. So, what will happen? I can say that this is my processor or say CPU and we are having this particular main memory. So, somewhere in the main memory I am storing my program. And what will happen? We are having the interconnection. So, they are connected together. Now, when I am going to execute this particular program, this program is having several instruction and we are storing the instruction one by one. So, first we have to bring this instruction from this main memory to the processor. So, bringing the information from main memory to the processor is known as the fetching of the instruction. So, this is the fetch. When we fetch the instruction, then what will happen? Now, my information is inside my processor. Now, we are going to execute that particular instruction or we are going to perform the task. We said this is the execution phase. So, that is why you are saying that it is having two step and we can say that this is the instruction cycle. First, we are going to fetch the instruction. After fetching it, we are going to execute the instruction. And program is a collection of instruction. After execution of the instruction, we go back over here. Again, we will fetch the next instruction, we will execute it. Until and unless we are going to get the last instruction, which may be an instruction or stop instruction, at that particular point, we will come out from this cycle and execution of this particular instruction is over. So, mainly in instruction cycle, we can say that it is having the six two step fetch and execute. But depending on the nature of this instruction, that execution phase or in execution of instruction may have again several phases. We can have several phases for this execution phase, because it may happen that to execute some instruction, we are getting the instruction, but we have to get the data. Again, this data is uh, available in main memory. So, we are having the data over here. So, what will happen? After getting the instruction, we know that we have to take the data from my main memory. Then again, you have to fetch or take this particular instruct data. Once I get both the data, then I can perform the addition operation. So, that execution phase can be again sub divided into several phases. So, one simple example I can say that now in general, I can say that we are fetching the instruction then we are executing it after completion of the executing we are going to fetch the next instruction. So, this is the way we are going to set up fetch and execute, but after fetching some instruction if we know that that instruction needs some data then we have to fetch this particular data from the memory. So, for that we are having this particular indirect cycle we are going to fetch the data from the memory and that data will be supplied to the execution unit and it is going to execute it complete it. Here we have shown another one which is written as our interrupt. These things basically related to handle the input output devices. When we are going to discuss about the I O module at that time we are going to discuss about this particular interrupt, but currently you can say that it is fetch and execute, but to fetch uh, to execute some instruction if we need some data then we will go to the indirect cycle to fetch those particular data. So, we have seen now the model of computer and 
how we are going to execute the program. And nowadays, you are all of you are using computers to do some different work. Mainly, most of you are doing the net browsing. You are sending mail. You are writing computer program. Now, in this particular course, we are going to say how our program is exactly going to execute it in the processor, and to do that, how we are going to design this particular processor. Now, since we are using computers nowadays, but uh, it is better to know how we are coming to this particular level. We are using very advanced computer nowadays, and we are solving many more complicated problem with the help of computer, but in one day we have not achieved it. So, just now we are going to give some idea about the history of computers. Okay. So, if you look it in most of the cases we know that Charles Babbage is considered as a father of computing. In most of the book you are going to have these things. So, Charles Babbage has defined and calculating devices in 1830. He is a British mathematician. We are doing calculating. We know we are doing many more job with pen and paper. He said that why you cannot do it automatically. So, for that he is coming up with a calculating device and this is called as your analytical engine and the era of this particular automatic computing started somewhere in 1830. So, this is the start and nowadays also we say that Charles Babbage is considered as a father of computing. Then when we are having this calculating device, then we are having the concept of our programming, how to program these things, how to control this particular calculating devices. So, for that, that lady Augusta Ada has come up with this particular programming concept. So, we are having an initial programming language called ADA that is also somewhere in between 1816 to 1852. So, she developed a computer programming language called ADA and we have started with ADA, but nowadays ADA we are not used it. So, she developed a programming language called ADA. So, we are having the issues how to give input to the computer, how to put all the information in the computer, so that computer can operate it. So, for that we need some mechanism. So, Harman Halloway developed this particular punch card system to store our data. So, what it basically does depending on my information we put those things in a paper through holes. So, we punch the card and once we punch the entered information in the card, then this stack of the card will be given to the computer and computer reads from that particular card. So, this is the punch card system and finally, IBM has developed that particular punch card system and I think till 1980s punch card system was used. After that only we are going to have that other devices. Another machine has been developed by Atanasov very computer known as. So, Atanasov very computer is the name given to the experimental machine for solving simultaneous linear equation. So, to solve simultaneous linear equation, Dr. John Fanchet Andersov and Clifford E. very developed that particular machine. So, this is also known as the initials of this particular name ABC. So, this is another computing machine that we have in our history which is known as your ABC. Atanasov very computer and it can solve simultaneous linear equation. Then we are coming to the George Bull invention. So, this English gentleman or mathematicians come up with the Boolean algebra and that Bull's theory is basically used to solve our algebraic problem. So, this is the interfacing between our logic and computing. Then finally, the first computer comes in 1944, which is your Mark 1. So, it was developed in 1944. The Harvard Mark 1 designed primarily by Professor 
Howard Aiken. This is launched today. So, this is the view of the computer, it is a very big machine. So, it is a programmable electromechanical calculator designed by Professor Howard Aiken, built by IBM and installed in Harvard University in 1944. Just I am just historic reason just giving the diagram. So, this is the first computing machine full phase computing machine that we have in our 1944, but again it is some sort of analytical engine. Then next come the ENIAC electronics numerical integrator and computer this is the ENIAC. So, this is the first operational electronic digital computer developed for the US army by J pressure Eckert and John McCrae at University of Pennsylvania in 1942, 43. So, this is the another machine that ENIAC that we have. Next, we are having ANVAC. ANVAC is electronic discrete variable automatic computing and this is the computer first computer where we are having the principle of von Neumann stored program principle. So, it was completed somewhere in 1952. So, NVAC is the first computer which is resembled with our present day computer which works on von Neumann stored program principle. Then next one is UNIFAC 1. So, UNIFAC 1 developed by McCarley and Eckert for the Remington Rand Corporation. Again, it was a project of US government for the Bureau of Sensors, they want to make the sensors in 1951 and they gave this particular project and finally, that UNIVAC 1 is developed. Now, if I look into it, then we can categorize the computer into different categories. So, till now we have seen the early histories only, now we will see how we are coming to that present level. So, in early period till 1940 the technology used is your electrical and ele mechanical and electromechanical. So, you are having mechanical component those component will be controlled by electromechanical devices. So, first generation basically started somewhere in 40s to 50s 1940s to 1955 and in that particular time the technology used is your vacuum tube. We use the vacuum tube. So, for that whatever diagram you have seen over here these are very big machines because vacuum tubes takes spaces, but main revolution comes when the transistor is developed and all of you about the transistor and you might have studied transistor also. So, main revolution comes in the transistor. So, this is we are going to talk about the second generation. So, vacuum tubes are replaced by the transistor over here. So, sizes reduces drastically. Then third generation basically started somewhere in 1960s and here we are going to use that integrated circuit. So, we said these are the third generation basically in integrated circuit what will happen? We are going to put the components in an IC and you might have seen ICs also. Then we are coming to the era of microprocessor, we said these are the fourth generation. So, all the required components will be placed inside a chip ICs which is known as your microprocessor and I think you have worked with the microprocessors. Now, all the computers we have that particular processors and after that fifth generation we are talking about PLSI technology very large scale integration. So, in that particular case instead of putting only the microprocessor we are going to integrate many more things in the wafer and this is the technology currently we are working with this particular fifth generation computer in technology wise. Now, we have started with mechanical and electromechanical system, then we are coming to the vacuum tube, then when eventually transistors arrives, then life become easier and we are using transistor exten extensively to build our electronic computer. Now, at the time itself that scientists more has predicted something by looking into the trend of uses of transistors, which is known as your Moore's law. The Moore's law reads as like that. Moore's law refers to an observation made by Intel co-founder Gordon Moore in 1965. So, way back in 1965, Moore has observed something. He noticed that the number of transistor per square inch on integrated circuits has doubled every two years. 
So if we take an UFR area of one square inch, then the transistor that we can incorporate over here today it will be doubled in every two years. So, if we can put n number of transistor today, then after two years it becomes 2 n. After four years it will become 4 n. So, this is the trend that he have observed and he has predicted. And now also that Moore's law valid. So, more and more transistor can be incorporated in some area because technology developed in such a way that now we need very small space to implement a transistor, where we say it is a sub micron level. In sub micron level we can work. So, that is why the packing density is becoming very high. So, in that particular case if you look in the Moore's law, now it is 50 years he has predicted in 1965, now in 2005, 2015 in 50 years still it is valid. So, it is always increasing by following this particular Moore's law in one particular area it doubles in every two years still it is valid. So, whatever now we can put in 2015 now in 2020s it will accordingly increase. Now, for a particular processor now we are going to see the timeline of the Intel processor because most of you are using Intel processor say earlier days you are using that Intel Pentium processor nowadays you are using either i 3, i 5 or i 7, but in one day we are not getting it what is the timeline just I am going to give you about brief idea. So, Intel has coming to this particular microprocessor domain in 1971. In 1971 they have released the processor 4004 which is a 4 bit processor. So, they have come up with a 4 bit microprocessor in 1971 in the month of November. Just after 6 months they have come up with the enhanced version of the processor and the next processor is known as your 8088 which is an 8 bit processor. So, in the timeline of 6 month they have enhanced the 4 bit processor to 8 bit processor. Next they have come up with 8080 in April 74 after 2 years and now which became a standard for the Intel group and many people are using these things. So, they have standardized the processor. Now, in 1976 they come up with microprocessor 8085 which works on 3 megahertz. Okay. So, see that in 76 we are working with 3 megahertz clock and 8085 is a full fledged processor which can control some devices and as well as do some processing job. So, it is a full fledged processor that we have and in many places we are using the 8085, but 8085 is not a full fledged processor to make a computer. Then again in the same year they have slight click modified in and come up with your 8086 and which is a processor which is used to build the computers. Along with that they are coming up with another processor called 8088. So, these are the processors 8086 and 8088 which are used to build computers in that earlier days maybe in 80s. So, this is the line so, in 71 they have started their microprocessor business and in around 10 years 79 they have come up with a processor which can be used to build a computer that whatever computer you have. Now, already I think we have mentioned somewhere about that x86 family. So, this is the family of Intel x86 family. So, first processor they are having 8086 and similarly they have having another series 8088, but eventually Intel has withdrawn this particular 8086 they are not going in that particular timeline, but they are continuing their 8086 and coming up with this x86 family. So, in that particular case now in 8086 we are having the basic functionalities and it can be used to build a computer. Then after one year they have enhanced it and put some more provision, some more facilities and they have released it as a 80186. So, this is your 
86. Now, you just see that in 76 that processor works at 3 megahertz, but now in after 10 years this processor is working in 10 megahertz. So, I think you know that particular frequency that means this is the clock frequency. So, if I talk about this particular clock frequency I can say that it is having some duration whatever duration I am having b then frequency is nothing but 1 upon d I think you know that many hertz. Okay. So, in that fraction of time we can perform one operation here one operation means one step that we can perform. So, now due to the improvement of technology now in 10 years we have gone from 3 megahertz to 10 megahertz. Now, in this particular x 86 family now there Tintel has incorporated more and more features and making it more and more advanced and in 1982 they have released 286 then in 1985 they have released 386 and April 91 Intel has released 486. So, this is the architecture is same, but they have enhanced it for more and more instruction and so that is why we said that code compatibility at least in a backward direction why you say because whatever software we have written in 386 that same software can be run or executed in 486 okay, because we are enhancing the instruction set. So, whatever instruction we have in 386 same instruction we have in 486. So, that software will run in 486 also, but if you have developed a software in 486 where you are using those particular new instruction then that program will not run in 386 because some of the instruction is not available in 386. After that computer Intel is developing their processor and making more and more advanced and they are about to release 80586, but some issues arises over here and due to that they have changed the nomenclature now from instead of numbers they are coming to name. So, instead of releasing 586 Intel has release that Pentium series. So, this is the same family. So, in 1993 they have released this particular Pentium. Now, this Pentium works on 60 megahertz that means they have increased the frequency of the clock even. Now, after that Pentium 2 is coming into 1997 then Pentium 3 is coming into 1999. And at that particular point you just see that that operating frequency is now going from megahertz to gigahertz range. So, 1.3 gigahertz means you know 1.3 into 10 to the power 9 hertz and when we talk about the megahertz it is 60 into 10 to the power 6 hertz and 1 hertz is basically related to 1 second. So, in that way you can say that how fast we can carry out one particular step. Then Pentium 4 is coming into 2001 and Pentium M is coming into 2003. After that they are going to the multico business. So, in till 2003 or till that Pentium M we have only one processor and all the job will be carried out by this particular processor. Then they have come up with the multiprocessor. So, inside a particular microprocessor chip we may have two processors. So, core to duo. So, in that particular case we are having two processor they are integrating together. So, that means we can perform some parallel tax one processor will do one work and second core will do another work. Similarly, they are coming up with quad core in quad core we are having four core together and four core is going to operate simultaneously and they work in parallel. So, it can be done in a first hour and after that now they are coming with this particular i series in 2010 itself the Intel come up with three system core i 3, core i 5 and core i 7 and in after that in 2012 they release core i 7 extreme which is octa. So, I 3 is a dual core, I 5 is a quad core, I 7 is also a quad core 
but I 7 extreme is an octa core. In case of octa core, we are having 8 processing core inside the chip and it works on 4 gigahertz. Now, we, it has gone to these things. And now, Intel is working in the same timeline and they are talking about the new releases Skylake, which will be released in future. So, this is the timeline you just see that microprocessor era started in somewhere in 71 and in 2011 we are going to core i 7 with 4 gigahertz clock cycle. So, due to that now we can now perform we can do many more work with the help of computer because now computer becomes more powerful. So, this is the intel timeline they have started in 1971 with the release of 4004 and that processor microprocessor had 2300 transistor. This is basically the showing about the timeline with this Moore's law. Then after that when from 404 to they come up to 8008, then 8086x, 8086x, 186x and like that. And when they came to the Pentium, you can see that the number of transistor count gone up to 3.1 million. When they released this Pentium 4, that transistor count becomes 125 million. Intel Core 2 Duo, it became 410 million transistors. Now, I 5 is having 1.3 billion. Now, this is the transistor count that we have in this particular ship. Along with that, you can look into the area. Now, if you see that density, packing density, what is the number of transistor in your per square unit of area, you will find that still it is going to follow this particular Moore's law only. So, this is the timeline that we are having. So, with this particular timeline, now at least we are having some idea how the current transit level computer has been developed from the very basic 4 bit processor. So, this is basically about the introductory part of our computer, where we are talking about the knowledge model of the computer, how program executes and what is the brief history of development of computer. So, with this I think we have achieve the objective of this particular unit. We have defined three objective and I think we have achieved those particular three objective with the help of this particular unit. Now, after going through this particular lecture, just look for some test items or some question. That first question I am talking about something like that, compare the model of computer with human beings. Now, why we have coming to the computers? because whatever we are solving whether it can be done automatically or not. So, this is the way that we can look into it. So, first objective we are talking about the model of computers and then how computer execute a program. So, with related to these things as I am giving a test item or one question like that compare the model of computers with human beings. Now, you just say I am just giving an analogy. In computer, we are having processing unit, we have memory, we are having input devices and we are having output devices. Now, in case of human being also, how we work? Say, we have brain and when we talk about the brain, we talk about the memory also. We said that someone's memory is very high, somebody's memory is very low. So, basically what will happen? We observe the situation, we are having some organ like that through eye we can see something through nose I can smell something, through ear I listen something, by hand I can pick something, through leg I can go from one place to the other place. So, these are the devices or say organs that I am having with these things we are collecting some information and we are storing in our memory. And our brain process those particular information from the memory and take appropriate action. And to take the appropriate action, it activate the it activate the appropriate organ. Sometimes it activates my hand to pick up something. 
sometimes it activates my legs to run away from the place. So my process takes the information from memory, it processes it and it activates my some organs so that I can act. So this is the way we can look into the computer also. We are having input output devices. So through input devices we are collecting the information, we are storing it memory through processor, we are processing it and we are giving the output to the two output devices. So, we can make some analogy of computer model with human. Now, question 2 I am talking about correlate the execution of program in computer to the tasks performed by human being. Now, correlate the execution of program in computer to the tasks performed by the human being. This is similar to the first one, second one we have seen how computer execute a program. So, this is basically we have def defined in objective 2 and first one is we are talking about the objective 1. That means, this test item is related to objective 1, we have achieved this particular objective. This question is related to the objective 2, we have said how computer works, we are going to explain it. So, this is basically we can correlate now execution of a computer program and how execute and how human being carry out their work. Test item 3, we are talking what are the different components of a computer. Again in objective 2, we have said that uh, we are going to look into the different components and how they are interconnected like we are talking about the functional view, we are talking about the structural view of a computer. So, this is a small test item giving what are the different component of computers. So, this uh, test item is related to your objective 2. Another test item I am giving is like Intel, there is another company called Motorola. They have processor series called 68000. Explore the architecture and development timeline of Motorola 68000. So, we have just given some idea. Again, I am talking about that whatever we have discussed about the evolution of computer or brief history of computer, we have done in knowledge level only, just imparting the knowledge only not going to analyze anything, not going to look into the design issues of those particular processor. So, in knowledge level we have addressed it. So, we have addressed about the Intel family x86 series and we have seen how that from x86 to 8086 to 80186 and like that we are coming to Pentium, then we are coming to core, then coming to i3, i5 and i7. So, similarly Motorola is another company who is also working with a processor, they are having a series called 68000. This is the basic one, now with 68000 now what will happen, they are also enhancing the performance of the processor and in this particular family line timeline, they have come up with different processor. Now, you try to explore this particular information and see how you are going to, how they have developed this particular processor and enhanced the power of the processor. So, with that I am going to wind up this lecture of unit 1 of this particular module. Thank you.